A huge thanks to Brian for sponsoring this video. Mathematicians, welcome back to another video. Today we gotta be using a fresh new piece of Hagoromo chalk because this video is going to take quite a while. I'm not going to waste any time talking here. We are going to derive Binet's second formula for log gamma today and it's going to be an absolute monster. It's going to take ages and you can find all the prerequisite videos, all the 50,000 ones down there at the top of the description. Also don't forget to check out today's sponsor Brilliant.org. They got a bunch of cool integral stuff going on over there. More about Brilliant somewhere in the video. Now we are going to dive right in. So um, with this integral there's going to be a lot of stuff going on. It's, it's, it's not easy to derive and the first guy to derive it, Binet, um, probably had a bunch of luck coming up with everything here. So at first we are going to introduce a parameterized integral, i with respect to z, being defined as 2 times the integral from 0 to infinity of the inverse tangent of x over z divided by e to the 2 pi x minus 1 integrated with respect to x. And I want you guys to notice that this 1 over e to the something part looks kind of like an integral transform. And I think this is where the um, idea for deriving this formula originally stemmed from, from an integral transform. Now we are going to make use of a result that I have derived a few weeks prior to the making of this video, namely that we can represent the inverse tension right here as an integral from 0 to infinity, an improper integral. This was the one of, okay, at first 2 times the integral from 0 to infinity of 1 over e to the 2 pi x minus 1 and the integral representation for this inverse tension was the integral from 0 to infinity of sine xt e to the negative zt divided by t integrate with respect to t at first and then with respect to x. Oh, now we got a double integral. It doesn't look good any either, right? It's going to get worse. Trust me. <laughs> Way more luck involved in solving this thing right here. So now we are going to play physicist and we are going to interchange the order of integration um, because Papa says so and hence it must work out. Am I right? So we are going to interchange the order of integration and also what we are going to do, everything that's exclusively with respect to t, so e to the negative zt over t is going to come to the outer integral because we are going to integrate with respect to t. Um, at last and everything that with respect to x in some way is going to get to the inner integral that we are going to integrate with respect to x obviously. So this is going to be 2 times the integral from 0 to infinity where t is from 0 to infinity now of e to the negative zt over t times the integral from 0 to infinity of sine of xt over e to the 2 pi x minus 1 integrate with respect to x and then with respect to t. Ooh, doesn't look any good either, right? But it's getting better now, tiny little bit, because this 1 over e to the something minus 1 is nearly a geometric series. But at the moment it doesn't lie in the radius of convergence, because if we let x go to infinity on the e, it's going to go to infinity overall. Meaning we are going to use a trick I have used a lot of times before on, in, on analytic number theory. In, analytic number theory integrals, I'm terribly sorry. English, English, not my strongest point, okay? We are going to expand this fraction by e to the negative 2 pi x over e to the negative 2 pi x. And if we were to expand the denominator here, okay, e to the something times e to the negative something is going to turn out to be just 1. And then obviously minus 1 times this thing is just e to the negative 2 pi x. And this is good because 1 over 1 minus e to the something is going to be just the geometric series basically in our e to the negative something, leaving us overall with 2 times the integral from 0 to infinity. So at first we're going to end up with what we have here, e to the negative zt over t times the integral from 0 to infinity. Now okay, sine xt times e to the something is just going to stay how it is for now e to negative 2 pi xt, uh, no, 2 pi x, just 2 pi x, and then we're going to end up with the infinity boy, where k is greater or equal to 0, of, okay, just e to the negative 2 pi x raised to the kth power is leaving us with e to the negative 2 pi x times k. All of this integrate with respect to x at first, and at the end with respect to t. Whew. Now we are going to play physicist once again and we are going to say, okay, our geometric series basically converges uniformly kind of here on this interval except for zero. We do some limit argumentations. We let epsilon 
be a variable down here and take limits and see if they um, coexist here. All right, if we can interchange stuff. So we are just going to interchange our geometric series and this integral right here because, well, Papa says it does work out, so it must work out, leaving us with two times the infinity boy from zero to infinity of e to the negative set t over t times the other infinity boy, where k is greater or equal to zero of the integral from zero to infinity. It's getting, it's getting better, all right? We are getting a bunch of stuff here. Sine of xt times. Okay, we have the same basis down here, something with e. Also, we can now bring together the exponents. We have negative 2 pi x minus 2 pi xk. So two, negative 2 pi x is a common factor that we can factor out up here, negative 2 pi x. And what we are going to be left with is 1 plus k overall. So 1 plus k dx dt. Now we are going to make things a tiny little bit better because um, this right here is really easy to integrate using uh, integration by parts or something like this. But um, at first I would like to make a tiny little change of index which is going to come in handy later. So we have this 1 plus k here. Let's say we're going to say n is equal to 1 plus k, our new running index. Then if we let um, k be equal to 0, then n starts at, okay, 1 plus 0 is 1. So our n is going to start at 1, basically, up until infinity. Meaning if we were to say, okay, our 1 plus k is nothing but k just now, or n really doesn't matter, our running index is going to start at 1, and it's now going to look a tiny little bit better. Now the evaluation of this integral is very trivial, left as an exercise to the viewer. I'm still going to do it here, you can find the outtake over on the trivial channel. Leaving us overall with a with value of i being equal to t over a squared plus t squared where our a is 2 pi k. Okay, now if we were to plug this in, we are going to get out that this right here is going to be 2 times the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative z t over t times the infinity boy where k is greater or equal to 1 of t over t squared plus 2 pi k, but the whole thing squared, integrated with respect to t. And this is good. Now we have a single integral, which is good. Now here comes the next horror. This thing right here, evaluated. I have, I think, derived it before last advent calendar as being the most beautiful result in mathematics. But I'm going to go through the process yet again. And we are going to start off with just a cotangent. Oh, trigonometric functions, where do they come from? Well, they just fall from the sky. Like I said before, this right here is pretty arbitrary, okay? That's a pretty lucky result that our boy Binet got out on the other side. So we are going to begin with the cotangent of z. Okay, cotangent by definition is nothing but the cosine of z over the sine of z. Now we are going to turn this into hyperbolic functions. This does work out nicely if you just put an i into there. So we are going to say our z is going to be a complex number with just an imaginary part. So let's say this is z times i. It really doesn't matter if it's just an imaginary part. We are going to say that z times i is going to be our argument. Okay, forget what I said before. z times i. Now, the good thing about the cosine of z times i is that it's just going to turn into the cos of z. Now here with the sign we're going to have a tiny little problem because if you are to plug this i times z into the Euler form, you are going to get okay e to the um, e to the negative z minus e to the z over 2 times i out. You are going to get yourself the negative to the outside and you are going to multiply everything by i. You are going to end up with i times the sinh of z. Okay, you can go through those easy calculations. I'm not going to elaborate on this any further because it's way too trivial considering the, um, the difficulty on this topic that we are doing right here. Meaning overall, if we were to multiply both sides by i, we are going to get out that i times the cotangent of i times z is cos over sinh, which is by definition nothing but the hyperbolic cotangent of z. That's our starting point. Now I want you to remember an analytic number theory result which I consider to be one of the most important ever. This is the series expansion, the mittal kleffler pole expansion, you could also call it like this, of the cotangent. So we have found out before deriving uh, Euler's reflection formula that the cotangent of z can be expressed as 1 over z plus the infinity boy where k is greater or equal to 1 of um, 2 times z over z squared minus k pi 
and all things squared. That's a lot of stuff to remember, to be honest, okay? Everything out of my head, not looking at my notes. I don't like looking at notes when teaching, right? So now we are going to go through the same process. We have the cotangent right here, and now we can plug in an i into our definition. So putting an i into here, okay, i times z, this times i. Okay, we are going to get i times z, but the whole thing squared. i squared is going to be negative one, so negative z squared. Negative and negative is a common factor. Let's bring it to the outside, shall we? Now we are going to end up with something like this. Now we are going to go a step further and say we want to land at the hyperbolic cotangent. Well, why not multiply both sides by i because it's not equal to zero by definition. i and i is going to cancel out here. Then we are going to get i times i here. i times i is negative one. Negative and negative is going to become positive. And now we are close to what we are having here. We have just now derived what the hyperbolic cotangent, mittag pole, uh, pole expansion is, the hyperbolic cotangent of z. We are close to having our serious representation here, but, near, but we are not there yet because there's no two up here and there's a two missing. Where well, there's a really simple substitution that we can do now. Namely, what we are going to do is we are going to evaluate the cotangent, the hyperbolic cotangent at uh, let's say t over 2 to get back to our variable of integration. Now what are we going to end up with if we were to substitute z by t over 2? Okay, 1 over t over 2 taking the reciprocal is 2 over t plus. Now we are going to get an infinity boy where k is greater or equal to 1 of, okay, 2 times t over 2 is just t, which is good because we are having a t up here. This is good, this is really good, divided by. Okay, z is going to be t over 2, so t squared over 2 squared plus k squared pass squared. Now what we are going to do is we are going to expand numerator and denominator by 2 over 2. If we were to do this, we are going to get a 2 squared right here and down here, multiplying everything with 2 squared, 2 squared is going to cancel out with the 1 over 2 squared here. So t squared, this is good, this is what we need. And also we are going to get a 2 squared here, meaning this tiny little part right here is k times pi or 2 times k times pi, but the whole thing squared. So our argument in the infinity boy is exactly what we need right now. Let's bring the 2 squared to the front and now we can solve for our series s that we're having right here. Meaning if we were to declare this series right here to be nothing but s, we are going to get, if we were to divide both sides by 2 squared and then subtracting 2 minus uh, 2 over t on both sides, we are going to end up with, okay, 2 and 2 is going to cancel out, leaving us with the hyperbolic cotangent of t over 2 over 4, do not forget your 4, we are dividing by 2 squared on both sides, minus 1 over 2 times t. And this right here is the series that we were seeking, okay, seeking series. And now we can plug this new definition into here and thus we are already done with half of the thing, I suppose. Okay, if we take a lot of stuff for granted that we derived before in prerequisite videos. Okay, we're going to get two times the infinity boy from zero to infinity of e to the negative zt over t times the hyperbolic cotangent of t over two over four minus uh, one over two times t integrated with respect to t. Now you might notice something, namely that we can distribute the two into here and get rid of a bunch of stuff. So we're going to get rid of the four, leaving us with a two. And this two right here is going to cancel out. And now um, I don't think that t over two is a nice argument that we are having here in the cotangent, in the hyperbolic cotangent. Hence we are going to do a tiny little substitution. Let us say, um, let t over 2 be defined as eta, for example, because I love eta, meaning overall 2 times d eta after doing implicit differentiation is nothing but dt. Now we can plug stuff into here. I mean, uh, having the scaling factor really doesn't um, add something or subtract something to our um, up and lower bounds. Okay, there's nothing changing with the up and lower bounds. So integral from 0 to infinity of we are going to get e to the, okay, t over 2 was eta, meaning 2 times eta is nothing but t, e to the uh, negative 2 times z times eta over, okay, like I said before, t is nothing but 2 times eta. Now we are going to get the hyperbolic cotangent of eta, obviously, divided by 2, still, that's still what we have, minus 1 over t was nothing but 2 times eta. And now all of this integrated with respect to eta, but with a factor of 2. The factor of 2 really doesn't matter because we can distribute it into here getting rid of those two. And now overall, we are going to end up with i of z currently. B 
being equal to two times because we, oh no, one, one half, because we have a factor of one half right here, the integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative two z times eta over eta times the hyperbolic cotangent of eta minus one over eta integrated with respect to eta. This is what we are having right now. And before we go any further, I'm going to erase stuff on the blackboard. What is going to happen next is that we are going to differentiate what we have here with respect to z. So meaning Leibniz rule for integration, aka Feynman integration. But before we go any further, I would like to thank today's sponsor Brilliant for sponsoring yet another video here on this channel. Oh! So to make things short, Brilliant is an online learning platform and app which has over 60 interactive courses by now ranging from physics, chemistry, mathematics, all the way over to finances, statistics, etc. And it's just a blast to work through their courses. They have a really, really simple course concept. You go onto their course, you want to learn something about number theory, for example, be it elementary number theory or higher mathematics in their advanced calculus courses. From this point onwards, you're going to start with introductory lessons where they have a lot of text, you have a lot to read, and then you start working on your first exercises. You have to find out the answer, you put it in, and if your answer fits the provided one, then that's good, and you have done something right. Congrats to you. But if it was the wrong answer, then you can show the explanation. And they are going to give you a very detailed, long explanation on what you did wrong exactly, basically giving you the right answer in the process. So you can always check if you did something right or wrong, and if you did something wrong, do not worry. They are going to give you a proper explanation on what you did wrong exactly. Honestly, Brilliant is one of my most favorite websites currently just because they offer such a huge amount of content and variety to their subscribers. And that's just something that I'm missing on most websites at the moment. Especially during Corona, it's so important to offer more knowledge to people now that they can't attend school or university right now on a regular basis. So what they are doing is a service to mankind. It's just something that I highly appreciate and I just want to say thank you to Brilliant for doing what you do. You are doing a great job. So recently they have just added their brand new Infinity course, which was a lot of fun to do on my live stream. Check it out. It was an absolute blast working with you, my subscribers in this live stream um, on the Infinity course. And also they added their brand new uh, quantum mechanics uncertainty course, which is also really nice to work through. They got a lot of great exercises and they really enhance your knowledge on the topic, starting from the grounds up, up until higher quantum mechanics in some way. It's pretty fabulous. And you are going to get a lot out of it on the other side, even probability theory because you know quantum mechanics is just all about um, applied um, probability theory basically so that's a lot of fun check it out if you feel like trying out brilliant then make sure to check out the link at the top of the description of it you're going to get 20% off an annual premium subscription if you are one of the first 200 people to actually use the link other than that if you just click on the link you can try out a big portion of brilliant already for free which is a great deal considering how much content they have on their website already so many interactive courses with this very great course concept this is definitely something you should try out maybe get it for christmas maybe ask your um, parents if they get it for you as a christmas present because christmas is kind of around the corner other than that i'm going to erase the blackboard now and then we are going to continue with the main video now we are going to get to the hard part of the video where we are going to differentiate everything and then use a bunch of identities to arrive at something pretty dope. <laughs> now we are going to differentiate both sides with respect to z because um, yeah we can do so. This thing is parameterized and under the condition that we can interchange limits which we suppose we can. Um, it's going to work out nicely. Meaning on the left hand side obviously we are just going to get the partial derivative in z of our i out. Okay, here we are going to make use of the special case for the Leibniz rule of integrals. Namely, since the upper and lower bounds are independent of our variable z, we are just going to take the partial derivative of the integrand here with respect to z. And this is really easy if you ask me because all of this is independent with, uh, with respect to z, but our exponential function is dependent on z. Meaning, if we were to differentiate this, we are going to get a factor of negative 2 times eta to the front, okay, and everything is just going to stay how it is. Let us write everything out. This is one half times the integral from zero to infinity of negative two times eta e to the negative two z eta over eta times the hyperbolic cotangent of eta minus one over eta 
the eta. And you might notice that this is kind of fabulous because two and one half is going to cancel out. We can distribute the negative sign into here, just changing the order of using subtraction. Eta and one over eta is going to cancel out, leaving us overall with a way nice expression, if you ask me, for i prime of z, namely being the integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative two z eta times one over eta minus the hyperbolic cotangent of eta integrated with respect to eta. Woo! And now we can start getting rid of this hyperbolic function because hyperbolic functions are very nicely defined with respect to exponential functions. Meaning what we have here, our hyperbolic cotangent is nothing but the hyperbolic cosine over the hyperbolic sine. They both have a factor of one half, which is going to cancel out in the numerator and denominator, leaving us overall in the definitions as being e to the eta plus e to the negative eta over e to the eta minus e to the negative eta. And yeah, this is good, okay? This is really good because what we can do is we can expand both numerator and denominator with e to the negative eta over e to the negative eta, leaving us with ones here and e to the negative two etas on numerator and denominator here behind our operation sign. Meaning our i prime with respect to z is nothing but the integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative z times two eta. I'm going to write it like this because this is going to come in handy in a second times one over eta minus, okay, now one plus e to the negative two eta over one minus e to the negative two eta. Integrate with respect to eta. And now we are going to get rid of eta here because um, you see we have two eta up here in the exponent and I don't like having like numbers up here. Numbers, uh, numbers suck, we don't need numbers. All we need are pure variables. We are going to say, um, yeah, I'm going to use uh, t yet again because t looks better in my opinion. Let t be defined as two times eta yet again. So we are going to do a resubstitution overall. Um, meaning overall that dt over two is hence nothing but the eta. Now we can plug everything into here. Up and lower bounds are going to stay how they are because zero and infinity rate um, won't change when scaling something up, you could say. Meaning overall, we are going to be left with an integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative z times t times, okay, eta is hence nothing but t over two, leaving us with two over t in the process. And now we are going to end up with minus e uh, one plus e to the negative t over one minus e to the negative t and now dt over two. Okay, this right here is not part of this part. Okay, now we can uh, play around with numbers a little bit more. We can distribute the uh, one half into here, for example, um, getting rid of the two up here, giving us a factor of um, one over two in here. And now we are left with this expression for the derivative of our i and z. Doesn't look very good right now, but like I said before, we are going to use a bunch of identities that we have derived over time here on this channel. At first, I'm going to write everything out. I'm going to expand everything using the distributive laws that hold in the real numbers, which you can use because the real numbers are a field, right? So integral from zero to infinity, e to the negative z t over t, and I'm going to leave a bunch of space. This is going to be important in a second. Minus one plus e to the negative t, but with a factor of e to the negative z t. So let's multiply this into everything. So e to the negative z t over two times one minus e to the negative t, and then integrate with respect to t. Like I said, leaving a bunch of space, going to be important in a second. Now we are going to play it smart on the numerators because what we can do, we can always add a zero to something and it won't change anything. If we have e to the negative z t apples, then it doesn't matter if we place zero apples next to it, we are going to be left with e to the negative z t apples. And what we are going to add and subtract to it is on this part plus e to the negative t and we are going to subtract it yet again because uh, one apple minus one apple is going to be zero apples. That's work out nicely. And what we are going to do here on the numerator is we want to get this factor of one minus e to the t in some way up here too. But this doesn't work right now just because of our um, operations that we're having up here. What we need is a negative sign. We are going to get the negative sign out if we were to subtract negative or if we were to add negative e to the zt 
in some way but with a factor of 2. We are doing this because this and this is going to cancel out to being a negative e to the negative zt leaving us in the process after factoring it out with e to the negative t minus 1 distributing the negative into here is exactly 1 minus e to the negative t times this factor of e to the negative zt is going to cancel out nicely overall in the numerator and denominator but we can just subtract it we also have to add it so plus 2 times e to the negative zt and everything with respect to t integrated. Okay, there was a bunch of stuff that is happening here. Now we are going to cancel a bit of stuff out on the numerator here. So like I said before, this right here and this is going to cancel out to just negative e to the negative zt. All of the other stuff is still here. Now we are going to break up integrals under the condition that everything converges. We are going to, to, we are going to suppose that it does for the real part of z being greater than zero, strictly greater than zero. So at first we are going to break it up a tiny little bit. We are going to start off with what we have here because we have learned that we can express by Fulani's integral identity. So this is like the first idea here. We have learned that we can express the natural log of x as being nothing but the integral from 0 to infinity or let's say the natural log of z, that's a tiny little bit better, of e to the negative t minus e to the negative z t over t. And this is nearly what we are having here just with difference that we are going to have e to the negative z t minus e to the negative t. Meaning we are going to get negative log of z if we just turn around the order of operations here, the subtraction. Meaning this first part could possibly be our negative log of z. So meaning we are going to expand everything out. We have that i prime of z is hence nothing but. At first the integral from 0 to infinity of, okay I'm going to put the negative to the front, e to the negative t minus e to the negative z t over t integrated with respect to t. This is the first part. Now, next up, we are going to make use of what I told you here. Bunch of stuff is going to cancel out if we were to factor out the e to the negative z t on this part and on this part. We are going to break it up, namely we are going to get, okay, negative and negative is becoming positive in the process, positive integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative, oh no, um, E, yes, e to the negative z t minus e to the negative t, e to the negative z t over 2 times e to the uh, 1 times uh, minus e to the negative t. Integrate with respect to t, I'm terribly sorry. So much um, ma manipulations going on here, it's kind of it's kind of crazy if you ask me. So let us see what we already got rid of. So we got rid of what we have here and this right here. We got rid of this one and this one. So what is finally left is adding the integral from zero to infinity of, okay, on this part, what's left is e to the negative t over t. And we are going to subtract what from it? We are going to subtract two e to the negative z t over two times one minus e to the negative t from it. Two and two is going to cancel out, leaving us with negative e to the negative z t over 1 minus e to the negative t integrate with respect to t. We have broken it up, we have now three integrals. This one right here is going to be kind of easy because like I said before by factoring out e to the negative z t, this part and this is basically going to vanish in the process leaving us with e to the negative z t over 2. Which is extremely easy to integrate if you ask me. This thing right here, just this integral is going to be the natural log of z and what we have here is something that I have derived before. Okay, this was like the last prerequisite video. This right here is exactly our boy Gauss. Okay, what we have here is the um, digamma function of z, but being the Gauss representation. And don't forget what the digamma function is. The digamma function is just the differential in z of our log of gamma of z. Okay, this is what we have derived before. This was the pure definition of the digamma function. Meaning, our i prime of z is going to be now, finally. Okay, let us evaluate this integral real quick because it's really easy. If we were to integrate from 0 to infinity our e to the negative z t over 2 with respect to t, then what we are going to get out on the other side is something with 1 half and we are going to get negative 1 over 2 times t 
with the e to the negative zt on the top from 0 to infinity. On infinity it's going to vanish, we are going to get uh, 1 over infinity. Negative and negative is going to become positive, putting a 0 into here. Um, also we are integrating with respect to t, so we are going to have a set down here. Also if we were to plug 0 into here, we are going to get just 1. So overall the value of this integral is just going to be under the boundary conditions 1 over 2 times z. So this was easy. Meaning overall our i prime of z is going to be nothing but 1 over 2 times z minus the log of z plus our digamma function of z. And now what are we going to do? I mean we want to get back to our integral i yet again. And how can we get back to it? Well by integrating both sides with respect to z. So now we are going to integrate both sides with respect to z but now without boundary conditions because that's a bit fiddly squiddly. In normal case I'm integrating with respect to boundary conditions but that's not what we are going to do here. So integrating this, integrating this and integrating this. I mean integrating this is quite easy because what we are integrating with respect to z is nothing but the, the differential in z of log gamma of z. Meaning overall this integral is going to evaluate to log gamma of z. Binet's second formula for log gamma of z does make kind of sense that we are going to get it out on the other side. Now this right here is going to be nothing but okay um, one half is a factor that we can bring to the outside also we are going to end up with log of z that's the antiderivative of our one over z. And this right here is also really easy to integrate. Um, you're going to do integration by parts basically it's really easy to do in your head. This is going to give you zog, uh, zog log times uh, log of z times z minus z. If you distribute the negative sign into here we are going to end up with our i with respect to z being overall. So at first we are going to get one half um, log of z and then plus log gamma of z. Also we are going to get negative sign into here so plus z and then minus log of z times z but we integrate it indefinitely. Meaning we have to add an arbitrary constant kappa to this whole thing that we still need to find out. This is what we are having right now. Don't forget what i of z originally was. This was 2 times the integral from 0 to infinity of the inverse tension something over e to the something minus 1. Okay but now we still need to use um, boundary conditions here in some way. So we need to find out what our kappa is, our random arbitrary constant. I'm going to write out i of z again because we can actually make it vanish. So i of z is nothing but the integral from 0 to infinity with a factor of 2 but it really doesn't matter for the argument. So inverse tangent of x over z divided by e to the 2 pi x minus 1 dx. Now we need to find a limit for z such that this right here vanishes. This is the best case scenario and there's actually one limit for z where it does work out. If we let z go to infinity then we are going to have 1 over infinity in the argument which is going to go to 0. Inverse tangent of 0 is going to be 0. Definite integral of 0 is just going to be 0. So i of z is going to go for 0 for z going to infinity overall. This is what we are going to do. We are going to take the limit as z approaches infinity on both sides. It might seem weird at first because this is log of infinity, log of infinity times infinity and here infinity and gamma of infinity also goes to infinity but we can do way better than this and this is like the part where I struggled the most because I couldn't accept it at first but it does make sense thinking about it for a second. So at first we are going to let z go to infinity of left, uh, on the left hand side giving us zero overall. Now we are going to consider the gamma function as z goes to infinity and there's actually this very nice asymptotic formula called Stirling's formula overall. Okay, Stirling's formula is going to tell us that z factorial is going to be asymptotically equal. So the difference of z factorial and the expression that we are going to go here, not the difference that the quotient is going to go to 1, meaning they behave the same at infinity which is good. This is asymptotically equal to the square root of 2 pi z times z over e to the z power. This is the asymptotic equality basically. Stirling's formula I have derived it before. Link in the description somewhere. Now what is z factorial exactly? I mean z factorial is nothing but um, z 
Mm, let's put it in different terms. This is gamma of z plus 1. Okay, gamma of z plus 1, okay, this is just a recursive definition, right here for the gamma function is nothing but z times gamma of z. And now we are going to divide both sides by z, leaving us overall with z factorial over z being equal to gamma of z. And now we are going to take the logarithm on both sides because we are going to deal with the logarithm of gamma of z. Meaning if we were to take the logarithm on both sides, then log of gamma of z is going to be asymptotically equal to, okay, if we were to divide everything by z right here, because um, this is what we are using, we are going to end up with, okay, if we have the square root of z over z, this is the same as 1 over the square root of z. Taking the logarithm, we are going to end up with the logarithm of 1 over the square root of z. Okay, using logarithm rules, everything is uh, multiplicative. We can actually break it up, meaning we are going to have times square root of 2 pi. Okay, breaking this up using logarithm rules is plus the logarithm of square root of 2 pi. That's the next part. Next up, we are going to get the logarithm of z to the z's power over e to the z's power. Breaking this up is going to give us at first plus the logarithm of z to the z power. Okay, using logarithm rules, we can bring the z to the front. Okay, division in logarithms is going to turn into a negative sign. e to the z power. Logarithm of e to the something is just a something in itself, leaving us with just negative z. And this is what we are having at the moment. We can still manipulate this a tiny little bit further. I mean, the square root is just to the one half power. We can bring the one half to the front. Also, we are going to have one over z then left. So this is z, but this whole thing with a negative sign in front of it. And basically, now we can, for the limit as z approaches infinity, plug all those values into here. I'm still going to erase the chalkboard once more because it's kind of a mess, but you're going to have a better overview then. Now here comes the final part. This is the most satisfying thing about it. So remember what we did? We let z go to infinity. This right here is going to vanish. Okay, meaning zero is hence nothing but. I mean, we got kappa left. Kappa is definitely still there. And also we are going to let log of gamma of z go to infinity. And now we are going to compare it a tiny little bit. What is going to vanish in the process? When doing so, we have that one half log of z and negative one half log of z is going to cancel out basically. Okay, this is going to die in a corner. Also, positive z and negative z is going to cancel out right here. This is going to go away. Z and log of z and its additive inverse also going to vanish, leaving us overall after plugging this new definition in for log of gamma of z for z approaching infinity asymptotically, we are going to be left with plus log of the square root of 2 pi. And this is good because you know what kappa now is. That means that kappa in the process is hence nothing but log with a negative sign in front of square root of 2 pi. But to put it into textbook terms, we're going to bring the square root to the front as just one half. So negative one half times the log of 2 pi. Okay, and now we are going to plug our kappa into here, leaving us with negative one half times the log of two pi. And now we are just going to simply solve for our log of gamma of z because this is where we want to go. We want an explicit, very nice asymptotic formula for our log of gamma of z. Meaning overall, finally, log gamma of z is going to be, okay, we are going to have, uh, let's start off with the, um, we, we are going to subtract all of the stuff, so meaning we are going to start off with a positive thing, so z log of z. Next up is going to be negative one half log of z. Next up is going to be negative z. Okay, and last but not least, adding this to the other side is going to give us plus one half log of two pi. And also we are going to have our plus i of z still there. I still want to uh, gather some stuff together because log of z is a common factor here. So we're, if we were to factor it out, we are going to get z minus one half, leaving us overall with our very, very nice final formula for log gamma of z being equal to z minus one half log of z minus z plus one half log of two pi. 
plus two times the integral from zero to infinity of the inverse tangent of x <laughs> over z e to the two pi x minus one integrate with respect to x. And that's it. That's it. This right here is our very beautiful formula for log of gamma of z. And believe it or not, this formula right here is extremely good for evaluating asymptotic behavior of our log of gamma of z. Computationally, it's also pretty easy to evaluate stuff with it. So this right here was an absolute monster of analytic number theory popping up suddenly with our boy Binet, who, also done, uh, who has also done a lot of stuff with Fibonacci. Okay, so I hope you did enjoy this video. Um, I'm, I'm terribly sorry for the bit of cramped space I had from time to time, but it's just so much to write out and I just wanna um, get down with it. I mean, it's, it's just so much fun evaluating stuff like this and, and it's just crazy how, how someone could possibly come up with something like this. As a little information, um, the way of deriving everything um, has been done by myself. I mean, this right here is definitely a well-known result, but if you try to find a proof of this thing, I couldn't find a proof online of this formula right here. I searched for it because um, I couldn't wrap my head around it at first, but with Rabe's integral formula and this integral as a starting point, you are actually pretty good off. And with a few elementary um, operations and just identities that we have derived here on this channel, you can actually get to this end result after hours upon hours of trying around, trial and error. So just as little information, um, most of the stuff has been um, just derived by myself by just uh, sitting here for a few hours and trying around. But other than that, I thank you guys for watching. If you did enjoy this very long video, please like, subscribe, and recommend channel flag. Don't forget to check out STEM merch. We got some very nice uh, fractal stuff going on over there, just like the ones here fractal. Sadly, we don't have any kitty caddies, but this doesn't matter. Other than that, check out Flamble Maps too, and I'm wishing you guys a great freaking weekend and a flamble day. Ciao! <laughs>